Thank you, Yarek. Thank you, all of you. As, as Yarek mentioned, I am a board member at the Apache Software Foundation, and I've been around the ASF since almost the beginning. And uh, at the moment, I'm working as an open source strategist at AWS. And that means that a major part of my job is talking with management about open source and ways to engage with open source communities. Um, so management are a different breed, as you know. And those of us here are uh, passionate about open source. But when we go back to work, we have to communicate with our managers and not come across as zealots. So that's, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and, uh, you know, your, your motivation for talking with management clearly about open source is that you want your company to succeed and you want to keep working in open source. Um, Correct understanding of open source is a long-term investment in the success of your company as well as in your, your personal career. And so stepping back for just a moment, it's useful to think about your motivations. Um, why, why are you involved in open source? Anyone? That's your job, okay. That's a, that's a major motivation. Yarek here loves it. It's fun. Um, I got involved in open source to, to solve a, a problem with my own personal website back in 1994. Um, people talk about giving back or making the world a better place. You know, we're interested in people using open source for the public good. Email press at apache.org with your story. Um, <clears throat> there's a survey several years ago by opensource.com about what people say are their motivations for being involved in open source. And uh, the most common answers are around education and career opportunities, to, to grow your career, to improve your resume, to get that next best job. Um, but shortly after that comes answers like fun. And I, I really got involved in open source because it was fun um, and because, you know, it was kind of, it was cool to be recognized for something that I could do outside of my own company. Getting recognition from around the world for something that I could do was a huge ego boost to a, uh, a young developer. Um, and you know, the, the great thing about, about a conference like this is that it's like sitting around a campfire with, with your friends and family. We all speak the same language. We have a lot of the same stories. Um, those of us with, with uh, grayer beards will, will talk about our early days on, uh, on our old Unix machines at our universities. Um, and, and another thing that, that we'll tend to joke about is that time that you spoke with management and they clearly didn't get it. And uh, those, those are fun stories, except when you're in the middle of them. And uh, so, what I want to talk to you about is the fact that this is not why your company does open source. And if it is why your company does open source, then they won't be around in a few years, and uh, you might want to start looking for that next job. So your company is primarily interested in open source because of how it helps the company, right? Um, and, and of course, doing open source can mean several different things. It can mean consuming, using open source in a product, it can mean taking an internal piece of code and making it open source. Why would they do that? It's important for them to understand why they're doing that, not just because that's what companies do, but understanding what they hope to get out of it. Um, or it might mean actively participating in an open source project in some fashion. And uh, all of these have different motivations behind them, which you hope that your management has thought deeply about, that they aren't just going in blind to do a thing because it seemed cool and they read an article about it. Now, I, I wanna make a, a, a small disclaimer. Obviously, I'm not talking about your manager. Your manager sent you here, and so they're pretty cool, right? They, uh, they understand the value of coming here, and they sent you here. This is my manager. This is uh, David Nally. He is uh, the president of the Apache Software Foundation. And so he really gets open source. And he understands 
uh, my motivations for being part of open source. But it's his responsibility to explain to his manager why this is important for our company. Um, he also, uh, a couple years ago, had the, uh, the honor, the, uh, I suppose it was an honor, of explaining to the United States Senate about open source. And so he has deep understanding of how, it, how difficult it can be to explain to clueless management um, nuances of open source. So uh, it, it's really critical when you're talking to management that you speak their language. Now, open source is an objectively better way to build software. You all know that. Um, but your management doesn't because it's a little bit weird to be giving away our intellectual property for free. Even though this is the way that the majority of the software world does this, it can still feel a little bit weird to, to people that are spending millions or billions of dollars on software development. Now, I want you to understand that I'm not telling you to lie to your management. I'm not telling you to pull the wool over their eyes and pretend. I'm asking you to understand that this is, in fact, an objectively better way to build software, and that your management wants to hear about that in terms that make sense to them. So, it would, of course, be reductionist to say that your company only cares about money, hopefully. They care about the customer, hopefully. You know, one of the things that we say at AWS is that we're customer obsessed. And what that really means is that we want to build products and services that give the customer what they want so that they'll stick around. Um, and so, you know, our motivations are nuanced and complicated. Um, we're also interested in the reputation of the company, because if we participate poorly in open source, then that becomes part of our reputation. We want to do open source for recruiting, maybe, um, to, to bring people on. So anyway, here's, here's a little bit more about how you might want to talk to your company. Here's some practical tips. You should read this book if you haven't already. This is a collection of essays from the early days of open source. Um, even if you don't agree with all of the things that uh, the various early founders of open source have said, it's, it's useful to read them to get some background. But I would encourage you to not lead with your management talking about uh, the, the differences between free software and open source software or the differences between the BSD license and the MIT license and why one is so much better and the people that use the other one are idiots. Um, don't get into all of the jargon. You know, if you're in the elevator with your manager and you have five minutes between floors and you start arguing about whether Richard Stallman or Miguel de Acasa had a better argument in 1998, then you've lost them already and they've moved on to planning for their next meeting. Um, <clears throat> so given that you just have a few moments, you want to make sure that you have your, your thoughts planned ahead of time. You want to be thinking about this now so that when you have this opportunity to convince management, you already know what points you're going to make. You already know the talking points of your company and how what you want to say relates to that. And so, don't lead with philosophy. The next thing that I want to encourage you to do is not to talk about open source as though it is charity. Um, we like to talk about giving back. We like to talk about the moral obligation to do things for the greater good. And um, your, your company is a company, it is not a charity. Now those of you who, that do, that are here that work for charities, they have a whole other set of motivations and I'd like to talk with you about that because I don't have a lot of understanding of that outside of um, the Apache Software Foundation itself. But for most of us that work for for-profit organizations, you don't wanna talk to, it, to them as though it's a charity. Um, my friend Don Foster, in a presentation a few weeks ago, said, if you talk about open source 
as though it's charity, then you can be guaranteed that it's the first thing that gets cut when they're talking about budgets. And so uh, you need to make sure that instead you talk about the supply chain and about how poorly maintained software is the weak link in that supply chain. Now, if your company is betting millions or billions of dollars on something that relies on open source software, such as Apache Airflow, then you need to make sure that that piece of software is still around two years from now when, you're, when your customers are rolling out their solution. Um, you need to demonstrate with numbers how this project run by volunteers is actually part of their financial investment. And data is your, your best friend here. Um, don't be afraid to talk about supply chain horror stories. Uh, tell them about the company that I won't name from stage that changed their software license several weeks ago because they could, because it was a single vendor project. Um, if your company was relying on that project, now all of a sudden you have a lot of uncertainty and uncertainty comes right along with risk and cost. Uh, tell those stories, make sure you have those anecdotes and understand how they relate to your business. Uh, this, this is long-term thinking. This is not about solving today's problems. This is about solving next year's problems. Look at the statistics and see the trends in the project and understand how it affects your customers next year. Um, some of these scary stories even have cool logos. And uh, I, I presume that you recognize at least some of these logos. These were um, just marketing genius when people made logos for security vulnerabil vulnerabilities and gave them uh, cool names that would show up in headlines. Um, Log4j, Log4shell is another great example of this that uh, took my manager to the Senate. And so Apache's, the Apache Software Foundation got on stage in front of the international software community um, and managed to get the story right about how that project solved a serious problem in just a few days and uh, what the software industry needed to do to do their part of it. So, a little word of caution here. Be careful how you use these horror stories because very often, if you don't get your story extremely clear, all that they hear is open source, bad, insecure, run away. Um, log for shell was an example of where this was done, I think, really well, where it shone the light on that project as solving the problem quickly. But that's not always the case. Um, often, particularly in some of these license rug pull situations, the message that people hear is open source bad. So get your story very clear. Now, everyone in this room has seen this XKCD cartoon, um, and you understand at a gut level what it means. And your manager doesn't. They don't understand that they're that thing teetering on top, and they don't understand that that thing at the bottom is literally maintained by two guys named Steve that you've never met. And uh, this is something that you need to be able to frame in terms that they actually understand about how that thing on top and the dependency chain makes them vulnerable if they don't shore up that bottom bit. Also help them to understand what they can do to shore up that bottom bit. Put a developer on the project. Maybe, uh, maybe give some financial support to that individual, but maybe that's not what they want. Maybe they really want somebody to come and triage issues and uh, review pull requests. And uh, in, in open source, that tends to be the more common need. But uh, make sure that you understand how this relates directly to your business. Make sure that you understand the numbers so this is a fictitious example, of course, but uh, if you can fill in the blanks here, if you can say our product made $3.4 billion last year 
And if this open source project that's maintained by someone in Kazakhstan on GitHub goes away tomorrow, here's what it's going to cost us to replace that dependency. And, uh, you know, always, always tie it back to customers. Always tie it back to the customers that are going to go to your competitor if you don't provide a solution quickly enough. Again, tell the horror stories. <clears throat> um, so, back to supply chain. Uh, sustainability is, can be very difficult to explain, um, you know, in that, in that five minute elevator ride. So uh, I, I tend to focus on a few things and then expand the story if I have a second meeting. Um, one of the things that I tend to focus on is whether a project that we rely on is maintained by a single vendor and whether we're friendly with that vendor. Um, Airflow is an amazing community that is composed of multiple, uh, multiple vendors that work well together, talk to one another, and none of them are overwhelmingly controlling the project. And that is very encouraging to, to me, to us as a company, when we rely, when we have a service that's based on this uh, software. That is not always the case, um, as, as of course you're aware. Uh, this can be even more of a concern when it's a single developer uh, you know, the, the example of the individual in Kazakhstan is not a fictitious example. It is an actual project that my company relies on and terrifies me. Um, so uh, when you have multiple companies involved in a project and when they are your competitors, the question that always comes up is, aren't we helping our competitors by doing this work? Uh, at AWS, we have this phrase, we call it undifferentiated heavy lifting. And what that, what that mouthful means is that open source solves the problems that are common to all of us, and then we focus on what we're uniquely good at. We're really good at, at scale and, uh, and deployment and management. And uh, so we share the part of the project that is common to everyone, common to all of our customers, and you know maybe our potential customers that are currently with another company, that's cool too. Um, but we focus primarily on our messaging being around what we're really good at. So single vendor projects are the thing that, uh, that keeps me up at night. I've obscured this particular slide, but this is statistics on a project that uh, some of you might use and care about. And those color bars indicate the companies that are involved in the project. Neither one of those companies is my company. Um, and if one of those companies should decide tomorrow, hey, we're not really interested in being involved in this project anymore. We're just going to fork it and take it internal, which would be in their rights to do under the Apache software license. We'd be in a world of hurt. What are we going to do about that? Well, hopefully we're going to get more engaged in this project and become uh, part of the decision-making process. And that happens when you get on the mailing list and you start talking with people. It happens when you send your first pull request and you begin to earn trust within that project. Um, and, and, you know, the risk here is, is pretty obvious. Single vendor projects are about that vendor's priorities, which sounds obvious when you say it, but... Uh, there, there tends to be, you know, in, in uh, big businesses that rely on a piece of open source software, they tend to think that that forest will never be depleted. So they can go and cut down the trees all day long, and there will always be more. Right up until the time that there aren't, they think that. So this is something that you need to talk to your management about. Here's a project that you might be a little more familiar with. And uh, I'm, I'm going to pick on my friend here. You see those, those big pink bars there? That indicates one developer who is responsible for a significant portion of the code in a particular popular open source project. Now, what is encouraging to me about this is that he's not alone up there, that he's surrounded by you, this community of developers, and if, if, uh, if Yarek were to win the lottery tomorrow, 
this project would continue. We'd all be sad that he went away, or we'd be happy for him, obviously, you know. But uh, it, uh, single developer projects are even more frightening than single, ve single vendor projects because then you are dependent upon all sorts of things that are so completely out of your control. War and disease and, and uh, you know, just change job situations. Um, this is why it's so important to be engaged. All right, let's talk about another motivation that's common in open source, and that is popularity. I got addicted to open source because I got email from people around the world thanking me for writing the documentation on the Apache web server and telling me that I was awesome. And that's a huge ego boost. These are my two beautiful children, and uh, they were completely uninterested in popularity in high school, even though they're incredibly photogenic. Um, and uh, so they, you know, they cultivated interests that were not around popularity. But so many of their colleagues, so many of their friends were just, just only interested in popularity and uh, would do all sorts of weird things that we won't discuss from stage. Um, people get involved in open source software because of popularity. Your company is not interested in how popular you are. Um, instead, this is my other beautiful daughter, and uh, your company is interested in driving the project. Uh, they're interested in having influence in the roadmap. And that influence comes from you. It comes from your, your popularity, I suppose you could say. But it comes from the trust that you have earned in that project. And that trust comes from hard work. And so you do that hard work, and people recognize you as an expert, and expertise becomes leadership. Your leadership allows you, and you know, to a certain extent, by extension, it allows your company to drive the roadmap of that project. And uh, so this, this, is what, uh, this is what you are, uh, this is what you're doing when you're building popularity within a project. You're building influence so that you can drive. Um, so, you know, don't talk so much about, about, uh, popularity as leadership and adoption. Um, we, uh, my, my company's involved in Apache Kafka, and we promote Apache Kafka through the events and through the project in order to drive adoption. You know, it's, it's, it's self-serving here, right? We want people to adopt Kafka so that they'll come to us to use a service. Now, those of, us, those of you that are cloud providers in some sense, you need to understand that nobody chose you they chose Airflow, and then they looked around to see who was best at it. And uh, people choose Apache Kafka, and then they look around at the various vendors to see who's best at operating it in their industry. And it's not always us, you know. Sometimes it's someone else, and our work on Kafka benefits these other companies. That's cool. Uh, a rising tide lifts all boats, and sometimes always the work that you do in open source is gonna benefit people other than yourself. But a lot of those people are customers. And as you build your influence and your reputation within the community, those customers notice that. And they try to choose the organization with the most expertise. And of course, we do open source because it's fun. Here's a bunch of my, my new friends in, uh, in Kenya at a conference that I went to a few months ago on the party bus. And uh, open source is a huge amount of fun. I love coming to these events and hanging out with old friends and meeting new friends. And um, your company is not interested in you having fun despite what they said when they were recruiting you. But uh, recruitment is, is the point here, right? If you tell the world that your company is good at open source, my company is awesome at open source. You all should come work for us. And we do have a lot of fun along the way, but uh, you know, we're also building our expertise and uh, we, our, our involvement in open source and our participation in conferences like this, maybe it's a little self-serving. We want you to believe that, that we are a fun place to work. Um, 
You want to be careful, though. If you promise a potential employee that they're going to be working on open source, and then after a few months you say, you know what, we're really going to have you working on this internal closed source thing and carry a pager, then uh, it not only increases the chance that they'll go somewhere else, it always also means that they'll tell their friends, you don't want to trust those people because they're, they're not really going to fulfill their promise. So be very careful that you're true to your word and that you're very upfront about what sort of involvement in open source is actually involved in these jobs. One of the top reasons for getting involved in open source is resume building. This is particularly true about or, uh, uh, programs like Google Summer of Code. People get involved in that because, you know, you get a nice check at the end of it, but also it looks awesome on your resume. And um, you, you end up with skills that are not just technical. One of the most important skills in open source is people skills. You have to deal with angry people on mailing lists that do not speak your, your language natively and are, are trying desperately to solve an urgent problem and you are in the way. And so dealing with people becomes one of the most critical skills in open source. And people skills translates directly to you becoming the manager that has to field all these questions the next time. Um, and so your, your, your manager is not interested in your uh, resume so much as they are in how open source is a source of continuing education. Being involved in open source is absolutely the best way to build your expertise um, across multiple disciplines, not just technical. And uh, it's free, right? Completely free. Uh, oh, by the way, this is my, my photogenic son and his girlfriend and my wife at his graduation, which was absolutely not free. We'll be paying for it for years. Um, and, you know, it reminds me of the phrase that I often use, free as in kittens. This is a free kitten that my daughter brought to me, um, which costs a great deal of money to maintain and has broken many irreplaceable items in my house. Um, open source is free as in kittens. And uh, you need to be very careful about how you promote the cost benefits of open source to your employer. Because if you treat open source as free, then you're missing, well, you're missing the hidden costs of deployment and maintenance and so on. But you're also downplaying the importance of participation. Because if you're using open source without participating in it, then you are, you're, you're killing the cow in, in the name of, of getting the milk, you know, for a terrible analogy. Uh, my wife is a silversmith. Here's one of the, the uh, gorgeous items that she makes. And uh, when people buy her product, they're not really interested in how much work went into it. They're interested in whether it's beautiful and uh, whether it's going to last. Um, com customers look at their problems and potential solutions, and then they look around for the company that can provide them most cost efficiently for them. And this participation in open source builds our, customer, our value to our customers. It establishes our expertise, and you know, uh, if you want to be a little bit mercenary about it, it also allows you to commoditize your competitor's product. If you can open source a piece of technology that takes away your customer's advantage, that's awesome too. Um, that was really mercenary, wasn't it? So uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and I am running out of time. There's a lot of other questions that your manager is going to ask. Oh, sorry. Um, they're going to ask, can't we just fork it? Can't we just write our own and not have to depend on the community? Um, can't we just hire the maintainer and not have to work about all of this, not have to worry about all of this icky community stuff? Um, these are all hard questions, and each one of these is a whole other presentation. And I would love to talk with you more about this afterwards. Um, but it is important to remember that open source is not a sprint. Uh, my manager likes to say every time we talk to his manager that every investment that we make in open source pays off three years from now, not, not in the next quarterly report. And so you need to make sure that you're focusing on the long term 
and uh, companies are terrible at having patience. So uh, I, I see that um, they're coming to take my mic away. But uh, thank you, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you, and I hope you have an awesome week.